Hi everyone, thanks for joining us in this talk, AI in a Minefield, Learning from Poison Data. My name is Jonathan Ozaria and I'm a data scientist at Imperva. For the past few years I've been creating AI-based algorithms to protect against web attacks. In my previous role, I was a security researcher. Here joining me in this talk is Itzik Mantin, lead scientist at Imperva. I'm Itzik Mantin, a lead scientist at Imperva. Uh, in the last uh, 21 years, I've been innovating in security algorithms and their uh, intersection. Uh, I love math, uh, I love algorithms, and I really enjoy the game of understanding threats and designing uh, mitigation. Uh, we start with speaking very quickly about AI and all the risks that are coming with uh, AI. Uh, then we'll uh, dive into the, uh, the threat landscape of uh, AI. Uh, then we'll uh, zoom in to uh, data poisoning threat, uh, why, how, and uh, when is this uh, threat applicable, and uh, what uh, can we do about it. Uh, then we uh, will uh, talk about how the data poisoning threat is, uh, is effective uh, and, is and can be mitigated in the world of uh, web or API uh, security, uh, and we end up with uh, summary and conclusions. Uh, no doubt, we are in the AI era. Uh, artificial intelligence systems are everywhere. AI technology is changing almost every domain of, uh, of our lives. Uh, and AI era is, in fact, also the data era, because the data is the fuel that, uh, that fuels, that makes this AI systems, uh, AI technology work. Uh, and both AI era and data era, they have a great contribution. However, this contribution comes with several caveats, uh, which we usually tend to ignore or at least uh, to underestimate. And uh, in, in this talk, we'll, we'll, we'll dive, we'll, we'll, dis we'll discuss uh, at least uh, some of them. Um, we we'll start with speaking about the uh, risks of AI. So AI, well, it's a new attack surface, we'll talk about it. It also provides uh, tools, new tools, not only for, for the good guys, but also for the bad guys, for automation, data mining, and attacker insight. But I think there are two significant risks that are really uh, important and uh, should be at least mentioned in every discussion on, on AI. First one is uh, deep fake, uh, the ability of actors, let's uh, assume for the sake of this discussion, uh, malicious actors to synthesize um, uh, images or audio uh, or, uh, or video scenes that look very, very uh, authentic. Uh, which can include, of course, uh, politicians or uh, other people that, uh, whose opinion uh, matters. And I think that uh, today we are, only see, we're start, we are only starting to see um, the, the impact, the potential impact of uh, this uh, uh, potential attacker's technology, and it will only get, uh, uh, get worse uh, in the future. <laughs> I'm, I'm confident about that. Uh, the second one, is uh, AI uh, discrimination, or actually discrimination uh, by AI. Uh, AI technology usually uh, takes data from the past and wants to predict the future. So it assumes that the future and the past are alike. But if we had anything uh, bad or incorrect in the, in the past, uh, like uh, uh, biases uh, for minorities uh, or uh, uh, racism and, and, and stuff like that, then AI has the tendency to perpetuate uh, these uh, biases. And uh, uh, for example, if there is a certain neighborhood where uh, people took loans and didn't uh, return it, then uh, new people from this uh, neighborhood that will want to take loan uh, uh, will, uh, will probably get a, a higher interest because they will be marked as a high risk, regardless of uh, what is the actual uh, thing or the profile of this particular person itself. This is kind of a, of a discriminating profiling system. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with uh, the Gartner hype cycle for uh, new technologies. Uh, and you can think also of the security life cycle for uh, new technologies. Um, at the beginning, there is uh, technologies being developed and all the developers are, are uh, very excited with uh, the opportunities and the applications. And they focus on all the technical obstacles that they have in order to make this work. And they pay only little attention or no attention at all for security. Uh, at some point, someone discovers that in some cases with particular inputs, 
this technology behaves in, in an odd way. Uh, and then another vulnerability is being discovered, another one. And at some point, sometimes uh, people start to ask themselves whether this technology will ever be uh, a usable in a safe manner. Uh, and then we we get to uh, once we are in the in, in the bottom of uh, of the curve, uh, security researchers and domain experts start to work together or alone to and develop methodology to give uh, to understand what are the attacks, to model them, to give them names, to develop mitigations, and we get to this into the the healthy slope of uh, of uh, development uh, until the. Uh, technology becomes uh, usable in, in, in a safe manner. And then still there are, there is dynamics of uh, new threats, new mitigations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, but essentially the, the technology is, uh, is uh, safe and stable. Uh, and we've seen that uh, for web in the 80s and for mobile in the 90s. And, and we have it in AI today. Uh, we are only now seeing, uh, we started starting to see um, um, more and more discussion about the threats that our uh, AI systems are uh, uh, are exposed to, uh, and this is a healthy discussion that I think will bring us to uh, to bet uh, better understanding of the, the threat and mitigation. Uh, so this is a typical uh, machine learning system. Uh, it has uh, in the training phase, training data is fed into uh, an algorithm that builds a model. This can be a classification model, regression model, can be trees, forest, uh, neural network, whatever. Uh, and then in the inference phase, uh, input data is being fed to the model and the model makes decisions on it, um, class A, class B, dog, cat, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, in some cases, the, the, the prediction that the outcome of the model is being uh, evaluated in order to continue and improve the, uh, improve the model. Now, looking at this uh, uh, system from an attacker perspective, now, if the attacker is an insider or if he's an uh, outsider that found his way in by phishing, a malware infection, uh, whatever, uh, then the sky's the limit. He can do whatever he likes. He can uh, steal the model. He can temper the model. He can tamper every particular uh, decision that the model tries to make. Uh, he can steal the data. He can temper the data. He can do whatever he likes. However, even when the attacker is, an, is not an insider, still there are pretty many things he can do. Uh, he can do uh, uh, ML evasion, sometimes called deception, sometimes adversarial examples. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with this example, a very concerning example of uh, a traffic sign, a stop sign, that when, uh, when someone adds a couple of stickers to it, then suddenly the, uh, the AI engine uh, of an autonomous car uh, looks at this uh, stop sign and he says, okay, this is um, a, um, a speed limit sign which of course can have uh, devastating consequences. And uh, from what I, I looked, every time the researchers try to, to build adversarial examples for a machine learning system, it was it was pretty easy uh, thing to do. Uh, the second threat is uh, training data poisoning. We'll speak about that in, in, in more depth later on. Uh, the third one, uh, training data leakage, it's slightly more esoteric uh, threat. Uh, but it is still uh, applicable. Uh, during the training, uh, data from the training data leak is sometimes embedded somehow into the model. And there are ways uh, to, uh, to, to extract this, uh, this data uh, that, leaked, uh, that leaked to the model uh, and, uh, and recover it. And when you use the sensitive data for the training, uh, health records, uh, PII, things like that, then this risk should be considered and, uh, uh, and addressed uh, properly. Uh, so how does data poisoning work? Uh, on the left side, you see a typical um, uh, linear uh, classifier. It uh, aims to separate in, in the best way possible between the, the red triangles and, and the blue uh, circles. And it does that uh, uh, pretty well. However, uh, you can see that even if you change a single point, then you get a completely uh, a different classifier. It still does a pretty good job, uh, but it is very different. And indeed, I think one of the things that characterizes the uh, machine learning system that sometimes very small number of uh, data points uh, can have great impact on the, uh, on the model. And if uh, the, the, these data points are added del deliberately, and now look at the, on the right side on this, uh, again, linear classifier between the red and the blue, then uh, an attacker will want to, to put, to create new data points in a place that 
uh, will uh, will confuse the model as much as possible. And, and indeed, on, on, on the right side, what you see is uh, that with these uh, new uh, red uh, dots, red data points, then the model is completely uh, useless. It does a pretty lousy job uh, uh, separating the, uh, the blue from the, uh, from the red. Uh, now, uh, data poisoning is uh, is, is pretty new methodology, and I, I mean I only uh, heard about uh, this, this notion a couple of years ago. But I think yeah, this is not really uh, a new threat. This is very old threat, almost as old as the internet, because I'm, I, I'm, I believe that, like myself, when you look at a uh, at a, at a review, a TripAdvisor, a high review, then you ask yourself, is this a real review or is this a fake review by the hotel owner? And TripAdvisor ask himself the same thing and take action in order to try to minimize the impact of uh, such a uh, fake reviews. Uh, and indeed, every rating system, it can be a travel rating system like um, a TripAdvisor, Booking or Google. Uh, it can be e-commerce rating system like uh, Amazon. It can be... Um, even movie rating system like uh, Netflix or, or, or IMDb, it is subject to data poisoning and, and people understand that and the owners of these systems uh, uh, understand that. Whenever you have data coming from outside and whenever there is a motivation for someone, and if you're doing something significant, then there is motivation for someone uh, to, uh, uh, to change your decisions, then uh, the threat of data poisoning is there and is probably being realized. Uh, one of the first uh, battlefield of uh, uh, of uh, data poisoning is the area of uh, uh, spam filters. I think maybe, maybe probably one of the reasons for that is that this is one of the first places where cybersecurity technology uh, based on machine learning uh, was proven effective. Uh, so what you see here is a model skewing attack on a Gmail uh, spam filter. Uh, the attack include the attack included uh, massive amounts of spam emails. Uh, all of them labeled as benign by the attackers and uh, they included patterns words that um, were later probably planned to be included in a uh, in a spam uh, campaign uh, later on and what the attackers wanted to uh, to obtain is to make the uh, the spam filter uh, the, the classification model uh, to uh, misclassify all these uh, this sort of messages as a legitimate, as benign, uh, and to pass uh, 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 so that the, the spam attack will be uh, successful. So this is, you can think of that as a sort of a backdoors uh, uh, in the model. That was their, uh, their intention. This is why the bay was in 2017, 2018. Uh, another example, another attack, this time uh, is this is a, a, a research paper on the spam base uh, a spam filter. Uh, this time, the, the researchers took a slightly different approach. Uh, they decided to try this. They uh, carried out an availability attack. They wanted to make the model learn incorrectly. So they took a collection of words, probably very popular words that are, uh, characterize many, many uh, legitimate email messages. And they created many emails that were classified as spam and uh, pushed these uh, uh, emails uh, uh, to the to the spam base uh, spam filter and uh, the impact of this attack was that uh, even with control of one percent of the messages uh, used for the training then uh, the, uh, the the researchers were able to make the model uh, classify 80 percent of the benign messages as spam and 95 percent of the benign messages as unsure uh, both numbers that, that render this uh, model completely uh, uh, useless uh, whatsoever. Uh, so now, probably like uh, I was in, in the past, you're you're saying this and you're saying, okay. So the problem is that we gave the attacker the opportunity to do the labeling. This is untrusted labeling. If we make sure that the labeling is done in a, in a trusted environment, then we're good, right? Wrong. In this version of uh, data poisoning attack uh, called clean label attack. Uh, here, the attacker does not have any uh, uh, any control over the labeling process, but only on the, on the data generation process. Uh, the victim here is an image classification uh, algorithm. What the attacker wants to achieve, he wants images of fish to be classified as dogs. And the way to achieve that 
uh, he uh, takes an image of a dog and now he, he crafts invisible noise, invisible for us, of course, and adds it to this image of, uh, of a dog. Um, for us, this, as you can see, the images still are, uh, look exactly like uh, uh, dogs, all these uh, images. Uh, however, this noise that was added uh, actually is being used by the model to, um, um, is considered by the model in a way that makes the model later classify these image, images on the top of a fish, he will classify them also as dogs. Uh, and uh, here, even if uh, we have the labeling happening in a secure environment by someone we trust, then what he will see in all these images is, uh, is a dog. And the attackers need zero inter has zero intervention uh, in the labeling process. Uh, this attack is still uh, very effective. Uh, it was uh, succeeding in more than 95% of the uh, of the cases with, and the classification was done with very very high uh, confidence, which is also uh, concerning. So uh, we understand the threat. Uh, what about mitigation? So uh, there are several pretty straightforward natural uh, uh, means to uh, uh, to uh, limit the the risk of a data poisoning. One of them is to uh, filter uh, suspicious data. Uh, for example, data coming from suspicious origins or uh, IP addresses or from uh, uh, suspicious uh, users, when you have users and uh, authenticated users in the system. Uh, when, the, 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 when the data comes from suspicious clients, maybe from, uh, from bots. Uh, and also an, another main, uh, a mitigation technique can be to uh, do fault tolerant uh, data sampling to limit the impact of uh, data points that are arriving from a single entity. Uh, limit the impact means maybe uh, take only few uh, data points from there or uh, somehow um, lower the weight that it can or uh, limit the weight as a single uh, entity can uh, uh, can uh, create. Uh, now, what exactly is entity is, is that, that depends really on, on, on the problem, on the domain, on the algorithm, on the model, on, on, on many things. Uh, for example, in the TripAdvisor case, it can be a user, it can be IP address, uh, uh, it can be uh, something like that. Uh, other less effective uh, mitigation techniques, um, uh, diff tracking, um, look for significant difference between the new model that is, was just generated and previous model, and it, if there is uh, uh, a, a, a high uh, the, a difference, high distance, then we can assume that we are under data poisoning attack or using a, a golden data set as a reliable benchmark a data set that we know for sure what is the right prediction classification for it. And then we assume that um, whenever there is a mistake there, uh, then uh, the model uh, was, uh, uh, we are under data poisoning attack. Uh, of course, when you have detection, you still have, you have to do something with it. Uh, Another, uh, I call this uh, uh, pseudo mitigation, is to uh, assume that uh, the attacker does not know what we do. He does not know the model, he does not know the algorithm, and then he will not know exactly how to, uh, how to attack us, uh, what we, the so-called uh, security by obscurity. Uh, here in besides, uh, uh, we, know, we know that uh, security by obscurity is, is very, very rarely proved itself as an effective uh, security mechanism. So, um, I really recommend uh, as not not to rely on on security by obscurity to to protect your systems. Uh, so uh, what we had so far, so data poisoning is a significant threat on learning mechanism. Uh, the threat is critical when using data from untrusted sources. Only some of the domains are cyber domain, cyber security domains like a firewall, spam, and malware detection that use AI. Uh, and rating systems like uh, travel systems and e-commerce uh, are uh, subject to data poisoning uh, threat. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no silver bullet mitigation. There are a collection of, of uh, mitigation techniques that when used together can uh, throttle the attacker to, to a reasonable, uh, um, to reasonable uh, extent. Thanks, Itzik. Okay, so how do we secure web applications and APIs? Well, here on the left, you can see the outsider threats along with the rest of the users. On the right, you can see the applications and APIs. And in between, we have the WEF, the Web Application Firewall. This component looks at the traffic and it knows how to differentiate between malicious and benign traffic. And it knows also how to block the malicious traffic. So how does it do that? 
Well, there are two approaches. We can either use a negative security model or a positive security model. Obviously, we can also combine both of them together. So a negative security model is a rule-based or signature-based model. The idea here is to say, we're going to create a rule or a signature for each attack. And then if the WEF detects an attack using these rules or signatures, it knows how to block them. So basically, you can say everything is good except for what is bad. The good thing about it is that it's accurate and it's precise because we know which attack we're trying to block and we're writing a rule specifically for it. However, if we don't know what the attack looks like, like in the case of zero days, we cannot write a rule. And also, we have to continuously write new rules for new attacks. Positive security model is kind of an anomaly detection model. The idea here is that we create a baseline profile for our website or for our API. And then we say, okay, this is what we expect the traffic to look like. And everything that is different from that is an attack. Okay, so the good thing about it is that we can detect zero days because zero days are going to look different from the normal traffic. The problem is that we are always in the risk of introducing false positives. Okay, so basically everything is bad except for what is good, except for what matches the traffic. Now, there's an additional problem. And that is that we need to learn this baseline profile using the traffic that we see coming to the website, to the API. The problem here is that the people generating this traffic can be normal users, but also attackers and hackers. This might lead to a case where we experience data poisoning and we end up creating a baseline profile based on attacks, which completely collapses the whole idea of a positive security model. Now, how do we actually create a traffic profile? Well, let's start with the object. An object is a carrier of traffic. Well, for example, querying parameters, body parameters, cookies, and so on. Okay, that's what actually carries the traffic itself. A container is something that is associated with an object. So for example, a querying parameter is associated with a specific URL, right? A body parameter is associated with a specific method and a specific URL. A cookie is associated with a website. And a, so on and so on. So a container can be a URL, host, method, or a combination of all of the above. Now, in this specific model, we're talking about a case where each object has a single container and a single traffic profile. So what is a traffic profile? That's a, a, what actually um, what actually represents the parameter itself. So we have things like type, can this parameter repeat itself? Is it optional or mandatory? It's size, charset, and so on. Finally, how do we deal with the, with the threat of a data poisoning when you're trying to create a web profile? Or an API profile? Well, first, let's start with cleaning the data. So anything coming from suspicious IPs, any suspicious events, anything that you don't trust for any reason, we're just going to throw out completely. Once we're done with that, we're going to do something that's called threshold learning. We say we trust something only if we see that it's coming from a lot of different places, okay? So that we can be sure that it's not this one single attacker that is trying to, you know, to uh, create an impact. So I say, okay, uh, in order to learn something, we must see requests from a lot of different IPs, a lot of different user agents, geolocations, and so on, and so on. Okay, so basically saying, if we see that many IPs and many user agents access a specific URL, then that increases the chance that that URL is legit. Now, once we're done with that, we move into enforcement, and we can say anything that deviates from this profile that we created is an attack. However, this is easy to do in batch processing. Okay, you just have all the data and you go over it and you know, you create, you group it, and you know how to extract all these different counters. However, it consumes a huge amount of memory and it's not always a viable solution. For example, here at Imperfer, we deal with 400 billion requests every day, so it's not that easy to do batch processing for so much data. So I'm going to hand it over to Itzik to explain about his solution to this problem. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, we go now into a completely different world and completely with different uh, example. 
a uh, dog food uh, tastiness uh, challenge. Uh, here we want to, uh, we have two uh, brands of uh, dog food, Pedigree and uh, Theo. We want to, uh, uh, to make a poll to know uh, which one of them is, uh, is good and, and tasty. Uh, and we are uh, running a poll. We have uh, 20 uh, participants and we got uh, 12 likes for uh, Theo and uh, six likes only for uh, Pedigree. Uh, however, we, we don't want to, we want to do a, a robust learning, a threshold learning. So we define uh, two thresholds, uh, three uh, cities and three breeds. And here only uh, pedigree passes. And the reason that only uh, pedigree passes is that uh, what you can see here uh, in, the, in the red part of the table is that uh, Theo uh, doesn't have any votes from San Bernard and uh, any votes from San Francisco. Uh, however, uh, Pedigree has actually votes from all the three cities and all the three uh, uh, breeds of, uh, of dogs. Now, uh, the reason for this bias is that uh, in the blue part uh, of the table, you can see that uh, we had pretty many Pomeranians and we had pretty many New Yorkers, 10 uh, and 9. And uh, all the people that were from New York and had Pomeranians actually liked Teal. Uh, and we have one, two, three, four, five, uh, six uh, voters that created the, uh, this bias, which is exactly the, the thing that we wanted to, uh, to uh, the phenomen, phenomen, phenomena that we wanted to uh, limit its uh, impact on our uh, learning system. Uh, so how will we uh, run uh, the threshold learning on, uh, on uh, this data? So we have a pedigree. Uh, this is an object we want to learn about. Tasty, uh, tastiness is a fact we want to learn about uh, the object. Uh, city and breed are two attributes, and three are, is the number of um, at the threshold that we are using uh, for them. Uh, and in the bottom, we have uh, the sets of all the cities from which we have seen uh, indications for tastiness for uh, pedigree, which at the beginning is, of course, empty. So uh, we don't have any data, so uh, we don't uh, accept the tastiness of, of pedigree. Uh, same thing for Teal, uh, same structure, uh, no data. And, and nothing is uh, is known uh, by now. And the same thing for a new another fact, uh, whether uh, the dog food is uh, nutritious. Now the data comes in, and now uh, we are seeing that uh, we have uh, uh, three cities and uh, three uh, breeds uh, that are suggesting that they like the tastiness of, uh, of pedigree. And then uh, a pedigree passes the two uh, tests for uh, tastiness. And we know we decided now that uh, pedigree is tasty. Uh, however, for Teo, it, it doesn't work because they have only two cities and only two breeds, so they didn't pass any of the tests, and they are not uh, approved as uh, tasty. Uh, so this is the data structure that uh, uh, we use. And now, um, if we are looking at that from a memory consumption perspective, then the memory consumption is proportional to the number of objects that we have, uh, to the facts or the properties that we want to, uh, to measure. Uh, to the number of attributes that we want to, uh, to apply threshold to them and to the uh, thresholds themselves because they, they, uh, they have an, in, an impact on the, the size of the sets. However, the important thing is that they are independent of the size of the data, uh, which is what we wanted to achieve in the first place. Uh, and what we can learn here using this approach is actually uh, Boolean facts that an object X, in this case a dog food brand, has a property Y, which that is tasty, uh, it can either have or uh, not have. Uh, now, using this uh, framework of Boolean facts uh, is goes is, is pretty straightforward, uh, very natural for our profiling system. Uh, what you do during the training, you take every data point, you extract uh, for a fact uh, uh, whether this fact was seen, uh, and then you take all these fact X seen flags. And uh, together you decide if you pass all the thresholds that fact X is allowed in the profile. Uh, and if fact X is not allowed, then you add to the profile a fact X prohibited. Uh, during the inference, uh, now you have a profile set. Uh, what you can do is for any uh, new HTTP uh, request, uh, you can uh, extract again uh, the flag whether fact X is seen. And if you have a fact that is seen but is prohibited, then there you go. You have a violation, you have an anomaly, and then you can do whatever you do with, uh, uh, with violations. Uh, the question is, is this enough? Uh, can you really, uh, what can you really express with, uh, with uh, Boolean flags? Uh, and for that, uh, Johnny will uh, elaborate. 
Thanks, Itzik. I'm going to explain how we can express profile features with Boolean facts. Okay, so the first and the easiest things to express are objects and containers. So I'm talking about things like digital locations, URLs, endpoints, hosts, methods, and so on. So how can you do that? Well, quite simply, just simply th say if uh, URLs and if methods actually exist. Okay, so you can say, is a certain URL accessible? Does a certain uh, URL expect to see a cookie? Is a certain method allowed in, in the context of a specific URL? Given a URL and a method, do we expect to see a specific parameter? Okay, and so on and so on. So we're basically just profiling the site itself. We're saying which URLs are uh, uh, available within the website, which headers are available, which methods are available for each URL, and which parameters do we expect to see for each URL and method, and so on. Okay. Now, that's quite easy, but what about the uh, data types, data ranges, char sets, regular expressions, and so on? You know, the, the interesting stuff. Okay, let's talk about type. By using Boolean facts, we can quite easily decide the parameter's type. We can say uh, if this parameter is a number, okay, if this parameter is a string, if it's none, if it's Boolean, and so on. Now, because we know that, let's say, a specific parameter is a number and we didn't see examples of anything else or we barely saw any examples of anything else, we can reach a conclusion that not only is it a number, it's also a, a not a non-number. In other words, we can say that non-numbers are prohibited. Okay, so that was a bit confusing, so let me explain. Let's say if we're trying to figure out that a certain parameter is of type string. Well, by looking at traffic, we end up reaching the conclusion that string type is allowed. However, as time goes by, and because we didn't see anything that isn't a string, or we barely saw anything that isn't a string, remember, we're dealing with threshold learning, we can reach the conclusion that Num types, for example, are prohibited, and that non-string types are prohibited. Okay, now that's the actual enforcement. That's the actual mitigation itself. Now, if let's say we'll see a parameter that contains a, a, the number 23, we are not going to let it through. We are going to block it because, as we said, num types are prohibited. Any other string is going to go through because we did not prohibit strings. Okay. Another example is, let's say, if we figure out that a certain parameter never has a value. Okay. So what we end up learning, or the important part for us to learn, is that none, nones are prohibited. In other words, we learn that it's prohibited for this parameter to carry any sort of value. And so if it does, we can block it. Now, let's move on to regular expressions. The idea here is quite simple. You create a bunch of regular expression facts, such as mail regular expressions, an IP address regular expression, and so on. And then by looking at the traffic, you can learn if a mail regular expression is allowed or prohibited, if an IP address is allowed or prohibited, and so on. So, for example, if a certain parameter is of type mail address, we learn that string type are allowed and male regular expression is allowed. But the important thing is that we'll end up understanding that non-male regular expressions are prohibited because we we didn't see any traffic containing any traffic that matches the male regular expression or we didn't see enough in order to decide that we are learning it. Okay? And that will lead us to a conclusion that if we receive a, a value that doesn't match the male regular expression, we're going to block it. So things like ABC or just a number are going to be blocked. Okay. What about multiple occurrences, uh, optional parameters, mandatory parameters? Well, the idea is again the same. You can create a Boolean facts for these things. 
So if it's a mandatory param, we'll end up learning that it, the parameter cannot be missing. And so if it won't exist within a request, we're going to just block it. Okay, finally, let's talk about char sets. Well, the idea here is that we can say that, uh, let's say, a certain type of character is allowed or prohibited. For example, we can say non letters are allowed, okay, or non digits are allowed, and so on. We can even talk about complete char sets. We can say non base 64 are allowed, or in other words, we don't expect any of the characters to not match the base 64 char set. Okay, we can even focus on very specific ASCII characters. We can say ASCII 21 is allowed or prohibited, ASCII 23, and so on. Okay, so let's show an example. Let's say if we reach a conclusion that base 64 is the char set of a specific parameter, we can end up learning that non-base64 is prohibited. And so, if a certain parameter value will contain a character that isn't part of the base64 char set, for example, asterisk, we're going to block it. We can also be a bit more specific. We can uh, uh, learn that a parameter is always composed of the alphanumeric character set and also semicolon and colon. So, we learn a few things which aren't that relevant. What's important is that we understand that non-strings are prohibited and that all these other ASCII characters that aren't part of the alphanumeric char set and aren't a semicolon or a colon, they're all prohibited. That will lead us to conclude that if, let's say, the parameter contains a double hyphen or something like that, we're going to block it because hyphens are prohibited in this case. So, finally, we reach this uh, very interesting uh, Boolean fact that we can learn, talking about param sizes for numbers and length for string. Okay, so obviously because we're talking about Boolean facts, it's very problematic to use continuous values because we're going to have to create, you know, an endless amount of uh, Boolean facts. However, we can discretize them and work, you know, with a, a small in numbers, okay? We'll work with very specific numbers. So in this case, we can say uh, for strings, instead of going all the way, you know, from a minus infinity to a positive infinity, we can say, okay, let's talk about uh, some values that are good enough. Okay, so when we're talking about strings, let's say we're talking about comment. We expect the comment to be, you know, at least five or ten characters of length, and it can be longer than, I don't know, a few thousand characters. Now, usually the attacks are in this, these domains. For example, maybe someone will send way more characters than expected to create, to create some kind of an overflow, okay? If, let's say, we're talking about IDs, so maybe the IDs have a certain range. They start from, I don't know, a few thousands, and go up a few hundred more than that. And maybe someone will try to attack it by maybe sending a negative ID or a very small number, a very large number. So as long as we can create some kind of a range, it's good enough. And it doesn't really matter if, you know, if we are uh, off by one, one or two digits. Okay, so how do we actually apply that? For example, if a certain parameter length is between 34 and 345, well, we can learn that the, the, the parameter can be greater than five characters and greater than 50 characters. And we can also learn that it cannot be greater than 500, that if it's greater than 500, then it is prohibited. And if it's less than 10, then it is prohibited. Okay, We're going to effectively create an allowed range of between 10 to 500, which is close enough to uh, uh, these values of 34 to 345. This means that if someone is going to send a string that is less than 10 characters or a string that is greater than 500 characters, it's going to get blocked. Now, finally, what do we do when Boolean facts are just not enough? So when can that happen? Well, for example, maybe parameter isn't, ex isn't behaving the way we expect it to. So for example, maybe a parameter matches both 
mail regular expression and IP address mail, IP address regular expression. How can that happen? No idea, but if it does, we're gonna wanna make sure why. We're gonna wanna figure it out. Okay, another example is that maybe the parameter is very sensitive for some reason. Okay, and then we're gonna wanna make sure that it's 100% secure. So how do you do that using this system? Well, in this case, we have a very simple site. It has four URLs, info about login and contact us. Okay, we managed to create a traffic profile for info and about and contact us has one query string parameter, which you managed to create a traffic profile for too. However, the login URL has two methods, get and post. Get has a query string parameter, which we managed to profile, but post well, in post, there's a body parameter that's very important. That body parameter is the username and the password. And we want to make sure that everything is nice and tight. Okay, so how can you do that? Well, using this system, we can already know what the traffic distribution looks like. And we know that let's say we get 200 requests and they are distributed as following 50, 40, 80, and 30. So login gets 80 requests and they split evenly between the query string parameter and the body parameter. So we can say, okay, we know that we receive 40 login requests with username and password, and 40 is a small enough number for us to deal with, you know, CPU-wise and memory consumption-wise. So we can decide to log all the traffic, all these different login requests, and then just analyze them offline, you know, do the batch processing and all this uh, uh, you know, all this traditional way of extracting information. We, and then we can end up creating a profile very specifically, you know, for this method and for these body parameters. And we can use it as part of our defense mechanism. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, so summary and conclusions. Uh, data positing is a significant threat on learning mechanisms. Uh, Threshold-based learning may provide an adequate, robust learning solution. Uh, the Boolean facts uh, framework that we presented provides uh, a streaming-friendly implementation uh, for uh, threshold-based uh, learning. And uh, although uh, this uh, framework at the beginning looks uh, uh, li very limited, and uh, many features can be expressed with uh, Boolean facts. And now we have uh, a couple of minutes for uh, questions.